the super hot is all around us. Where we work, in our homes, beneath our feet. I'm shielding my face just because of the radiant heat is intense. It's electrifying. It builds our civilization and may someday power it as well. The heat flux from the plasma, we get up to 600 million degrees Fahrenheit. We're cranking the thermostat way up. Now, it's the untold story of the super hot on Modern Marvels. What should you wear to an oil fire? Maybe a pair of these. They're fire retardant coveralls for oil refinery workers. And they're about to be tested by Pyroman. Residing at North Carolina State's Textile Protection and Comfort Center, six-foot-tall Pyroman must endure repeated exposures to fiery temperatures in excess of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit to help in the research and improvement of thermal protection. Pyroman is an instrumented mannequin test system that allows us to look at the response of thermally protective gear exposed to fire. What we measure then is the amount of heat that transfers uh, through the garment to 122 thermal sensors that are distributed over the torso and on the head. Researchers carefully dress Pyroman for today's thermal assault. Eight industrial-sized gas burners produce a column of flames engulfing Pyroman in his test garment. When exposed to intense heat, some fabrics can shrink, discolor, or char. Researchers must look beyond the effects of the fire on the suit itself to understand the level of protection the garment provided. They rely on Pyroman's thermal sensors to help them predict the sort of body burn sustained by the intense heat. Pyroman survived, but suffered burns. However, without the protective coveralls, someone in Pyroman's shoes would likely have been fatally burned in a fraction of a second. Severe burns can come from many sources, including scalding hot water. On a human, bare skin exposed to 140 degree water for three seconds can receive a first degree burn. If exposed to 160 degrees for only one second, a deeper third degree burn would likely occur, destroying all skin layers and causing nerve damage. While direct heat can burn us to the bone, excessive ambient temperatures can also destroy us. But that's a super hot that some runners take on every year. Enduring Death Valley temperatures in excess of 120 degrees Fahrenheit during the 135-mile Badwater Ultra Marathon. To keep their bodies from overheating, the runners drink at least six gallons of cold fluids in a day and are regularly sprayed with water to help beat the heat. This is critical because a normal body core temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, rising even seven degrees, puts vital organs at risk. That's super hot for us, because if the body can't cool fast enough, death is likely. A crucial means of cooling? Sweat, our body's own thermal defense. Sweat is extremely important in terms of regulating your, your internal body temperature. If you cannot sweat or release the heat, basically your internal body starts to build up. The Textile Protection and Comfort Center tests sweat response down the hall from Pyroman. In a special heat and humidity controlled room, a man and a mannequin are getting hot under the collar. While the man gives them psychological and physiological feedback, the mannequin allows for a more controlled test and can be pushed to extremes that could kill a man. We can get kind of a real-time monitor of the amount of heat that's going to each of those sections so we know how effective the clothing on a, each part of his body is doing. The areas in red indicate where less heat can be released, a concern if these were real firefighters. 
we have to make sure that they don't have an overdue risk of heat stress because they're already uh, so overexerted being in the uh, hot environment and just doing the work that they're doing. Of course, firefighters aren't the only professionals at risk of overheating. Welcome to the super hot world of our Cellar Middles Burns Harbor Steel Shop in Indiana. Workers here suit up to keep cool around temperatures exceeding 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The ambient temperature of the air that the, the crew works in can reach 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very um, high elevated temperatures. And then the radiant energy from the furnace is extremely hot. The workers require multiple layers of heat resistant clothing to keep this extreme heat at bay. Wool coats, we have our greens, which are fire retardant, our cotton shirts, and behind this, we have uh, insulated underwear that uh, prevent any kind of burning that are fireproof. Over all those materials, an aluminized based overcoat. The aluminized coating on the outer garment is designed to reflect the radiant heat, and it's also designed to prevent any splashed steel that would come in contact with the employee. Kevlar on the inside uh, is provided for strength and for insulation. It prevents the heat from transmitting through the garment. It can get pretty hot when you're working in the summer. You know, you just have to pace yourself. But the temperatures the workers face are nothing compared to the temperatures the steel-making equipment must endure. Every transport vessel and processing vessel in the steel shop is refractory lined with different types of brick. We either use a magnesium carbon brick or an alumina brick, depending on the process. To make new steel, the shop combines scrap steel with 2,400 degree molten iron and heats it to 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit in this basic oxygen furnace. Behind us here, you're seeing our number one furnace at the Burns Harbor Steel Shop. In the furnace, a magnesium carbon lining is the protection of choice. The combination of magnesium's high melting point of roughly 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit and carbon strength make them ideal for taking on the super hot. It's uh, about a million and a half dollars worth of brick. And that brick acts as an insulator between the 3,100 degree steel making temperatures and the steel shell on the furnace. On the outside, the shell is between 300 and 350 degrees Fahrenheit. In addition, the steel shop lines the bricks with a layer of a steel making byproduct called slag. This includes impurities such as carbon, silicon, and various oxides. About 30 years ago, the furnaces lasted about 700 heat, 700 cycles between rebricking. Now we're able to make between 20 and 40,000 heats on a furnace lining by just using the, the waste material to coat the brick. After the oxygen furnace, the slightly cooler steel will be further refined and transported in other brick line vessels before being allowed to solidify in a casting mold. A finished product. We'll cut it to the length of whatever our customer wants and ship it from there. The slab temperature at this point is roughly around 1500 degrees. And it's still really hot. But these steel slabs and other structural materials can also be destroyed by the super hot. The Center for Innovative Materials Research at Lawrence Technological University in Southfield, Michigan conducts tests to find ways to keep that from happening. Inside this 18 by 8 foot chamber, structural materials are put on the hot seat to see how long they can withstand intense fire. If you remember what happened in 9-11, the building itself did not fail because of the impact force. It failed because of the fire. The purpose of the furnace is to uh, simulate a fire environment.
similar to what might happen on a uh, building fire or a fire on a turnpike. Nine 3,000 degree Fahrenheit flames heat the chamber to its 2,300 degree maximum temperature. You need air or oxygen. You need a fuel, which is a natural gas in this case. And you also need a source of ignition. With those three ingredients, you could have combustion. What really makes this chamber unique is the fact that it can heat a 32,000 pound load to 1,000 degrees in five minutes. Thousands of times more heat required than a, a home. The typical home furnace may operate with 100,000 BTUs an hour, where this furnace operates with 18 million BTUs an hour. It also operates at much higher temperatures, requiring 12 inch thick insulation around the entire furnace. The center allowed the chamber's enormous door to open during testing to give modern marbles a rare opportunity to look inside. We intentionally have the furnace on very negative pressure right now, so it's drawing a lot of room air in to keep the area around here cooler. Otherwise, we might uh, burn up some of the cameramen and, and myself in particular. The door closes again, putting the pressure and the heat back on the concrete beam. While conventional concrete beams have steel rebar inside, this beam has been reinforced with carbon fibers instead. These fibers developed at the center are stronger and less corrosive than steel, but are also more flammable. After about 20 minutes of full heating, the concrete has crumbled and the fibers are singed. So we need to make sure that the next step in our search is to identify new materials that we can spray on the top of the concrete beams to prevent the heat from reaching carbon fiber. Certainly the structure will last for longer period for corrosion and fire. That could also mean increasing fire evacuation times from one or two hours to at least five or six hours. When you have more time to evacuate people, you can save a lot of lives. While thousands of degrees cause destruction in this chamber, several hundred million degrees in here may be an answer to the Earth's energy needs. In the world of the superhot, plasma is about as hot as it gets. It's the stuff that stars are made of. In fact, it's the stuff that 99% of all visible matter in the universe is made of. We think of plasma as the fourth state of matter after solids, liquids, and gases. This fourth state, also referred to as ionized gas, occurs when gas atoms become superheated, causing one or more of their electrons to be stripped away. The freed electrons move about rapidly, making the superhot plasma electrically conductive. A common visual characteristic of many plasmas is light. The temperature inside of here might be of the order uh, five or 6,000 degrees F. Now, there aren't a lot of particles inside of here. So even though 5,000 degrees F sounds like a high temperature, I can, still, I can still touch this, and it's not hot. And that's because the number of particles in here is relatively low. Increase that density of particles, and you've got that big hot ball of plasma known as the sun. The sun's temperature varies greatly from the surface at about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to its core of roughly 25 million degrees Fahrenheit. On Earth, we've learned to harness the energy of high density plasmas to create the heat for plasma cutters and welding arcs. And light from low-density plasmas glows in plasma televisions and many of the lights around us. Fluorescent and neon lights are really plasma lamps. They're considered low-pressure arc lamps with two electrodes separated by gas. When charged, the gas turns into illuminating plasma. Oak Ridge National Laboratory has the most powerful high-intensity DC arc lamp in the world capable of heating a surface at a rate of over one million degrees per second. 
That means it can process a variety of materials in a short time. Take metal powders on coatings and directly fuse them, turning them liquid, melting anywhere up to, say, six, 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We basically have no temperature limitations with this type of technology. Inside this very powerful, very bright, high temperature arc lamp swirls argon gas within a quartz tube, sealed by two electrodes on each side. When a strong arc of electricity travels between the electrodes, it strikes the argon atoms, generating an intense radiant heat, similar to that of the sun. To keep the lamp cool, jets of highly pressurized, deionized water coat and spiral around the tube's inner wall. The lamp takes the radiant energy of the arc and directs it onto whatever material is being processed. Super hot plasma isn't just handy for high-tech manufacturing. How about high-tech garbage disposal? It's used in Japan and U.S. military bases, like Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Companies like StarTech Environmental have created machines called plasma converters to break down all types of waste materials. A plasma converter employs a very high temperature plasma at about 30,000 degrees at atmospheric pressure. And no matter how hazardous the material is that we have, none of their molecules could withstand that heat. So the plasma breaks up the molecules into the constituent uh, atomic elements the system produces more energy than it consumes. The byproducts of the process include hydrogen and other gases that can be used to produce electricity for the converter, plus extra energy to be fed back into the grid. Additionally, the converter creates an obsidian-like stone with potential for use as a road base. Take the 30,000 degrees in the converter, make it over 3,000 times hotter and you've got the temperature needed for the most impressive and hottest use of plasma, the holy grail of energy, plasma fusion, the process that powers the stars. Harness it, and we could have an inexhaustible supply of clean energy. For fusion to occur, two light atomic nuclei, like the hydrogen isotopes deuterium and tritium, must join together to form a heavier nucleus like helium. Some matter becomes energy in the process, according to Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared. But getting there isn't easy. Because the particles are positively charged and it takes a lot of energy to overcome that re mutual repulsion force, we heat it up to very high temperatures, 200 million degrees Fahrenheit or more, to achieve fusion-relevant temperatures. While only a few machines have sustained these temperatures for more than five seconds, no fusion reactor has been able to produce as much energy as it consumes. General Atomic's D3D National Fusion Facility in San Diego, California, is one of several international facilities researching ways to achieve sustainable fusion energy. Someday, this limitless energy could heat water into steam which could turn massive turbines to power the world's cities. Scientists are betting on a donut-shaped machine like this, called a tokamak, which confines ultra-hot plasma with magnetic fields. So I'm standing here in the machine hall of the D3D uh, National Fusion Facility at General Atomics. Uh, below me is the tokamak itself. This is the largest tokamak in the United States. In order to create fusion in a tokamak, plasma must be heated to at least eight times the temperature of the sun's core. Because the sun has a very strong gravitational pull, it condenses matter in a very small area, and so 25 million degrees Fahrenheit is sufficient to generate large amounts of fusion energy. On D3D, where we use magnetic confinement, magnetic confinement isn't nearly as good at holding particles close together. And so to compensate for this, you have to go to much higher temperatures. So what does it take to heat something hotter than the sun? 
first uh, to get this up from a normal gas to about 100 million degrees Fahrenheit is we simply induce a current through this plasma. But to get fusion to really occur, you've got to get up to something like 200 million degrees. This is where other energy sources take over. D3D utilizes very powerful microwaves, high energy particle beams, and high frequency radio waves. With these three heating systems on D3D, we have achieved temperatures close to 600 million degrees Fahrenheit. To feed the fusion reaction, General Atomics continually fuels the tokamak. One novel approach that also increases the plasma's density is injecting deuterium ice pellets directly into the hot plasma. We like to call this a snowball in hell because it's a four degree Kelvin pellet being injected into a tokamak plasma that is close to 200 million degrees Fahrenheit. General Atomics and other research labs have created fusion reactions, but the goal of a self-sustaining reaction is still very elusive. Maybe ITER will change that. Currently under construction in Cateroche, France, the ITER tokamak is a historic collaboration between the European Union, Japan, the United States, Russia, China, the Republic of Korea, and India. So here we have more than half the population of the world working together to solve a global problem. This, in fact, is more important than science. When completed, ITER will be over four times the size of the current largest tokamak, JET, located in England. It will also have a magnetic field over 10,000 times that of the Earth's. The facility is quite large, with the plasma residing in this area. If you look at the volume of that plasma, it's about 800 cubic meters, which in down-to-earth terms is about the volume of the water in an Olympic swimming pool. So the bigger the plasma, the bigger power. Construction of this supersized tokamak should be completed by 2018. But don't expect to see a self-sustaining energy-producing fusion reaction for another 10 to 20 years beyond that. If it can be achieved, the benefits will be well worth the wait. This would be able to produce enough energy for humankind for millions of years. It does not pollute with any carbon dioxide, no greenhouse gases, and no high-level radioactive waste. So we think that's sufficiently attractive that it's worth dedicating our lifetime to study. While super hot plasma may someday provide us with clean, limitless energy, our homes are filled with another kind of super hot, a potentially dangerous kind. In 1995, a tokamak at Princeton University produced a world record plasma of over 900 million degrees Fahrenheit for half a second. That's over 30 times the temperature of the sun's inner core. Superhot will return on Modern Marvels. Under your roof lurks the potentially destructive force of the Superhot. Protection from various fiery dangers is the name of the game at Underwriters Laboratories. A safety testing organization with facilities all over the world, including Northbrook, Illinois. We test about 20,000 different types of products. You see the UL mark on the bottom of your toaster and the back of smoke alarms. And heating tests or temperature testing is one of the most common types of testing that we do. When functioning normally, a self-cleaning oven cooks clean around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. A coffee maker brews a 150 degree cup of joe. And a hair dryer blows air below 140 degrees. We're doing a demonstration to show what would happen if there were no safety devices in that blow dryer. What we're looking at here is the internal workings of a standard hair dryer. The coiled wire is the heating element. It gets very hot and air blows across it and ultimately dries your hair. The thermostat will cycle on and off and provide the right amount of heat to dry your hair. But if anything goes wrong, such as the thermostat malfunctions, 
the thermal fuse will open the circuit, shut down the hair dryer permanently, meaning that you have to throw it away because it's overheated and should be disposed of. For this demonstration, we've actually taken out the thermostat and the thermal cutout that would protect you from overheating. When we do a demonstration of this type, we never know exactly what's going to happen because these are very capricious uh, situations when you've got fire and smoke. How about a coffee maker without safety devices? Know what you're doing. Make sure you're aware of what is happening in your kitchen. Meanwhile, don't overlook that soothing lit candle in the corner. Actually, it's over 18,000 fires a year have been attributed to candles, and it's because you've got the open flame. There's a great deal of energy contained in a small space. One quarter of the energy created here will be released as heat, only 4% of which goes toward melting the wax. To break down the temperature of the flame, look to its various colors. You go from the blue on the outside, which is the hottest, at about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where the flame contacts the most oxygen and is able to reach complete combustion. As you move towards the center of the flame, the color changes from yellow to orange to red as the temperature gets cooler, where the inner temperature of the flame is about 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's plenty of heat to fuel a fire. When you've got an open flame, like with a candle, the only thing that uh, you're going to have to worry about is that flame could communicate to anything else that's combustible. While it doesn't have an open flame, your basic tungsten light bulb is way up there when it comes to household super hot. The simple light bulb, in this case, a 100 watt light bulb, the temperature of the film itself is on the order of about 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It's about 98% efficient at producing heat and only about 2% efficient at producing light, which we want. Heat may be wasted by a tungsten light bulb, but in a garage, it can be a super hot asset. At the Gator Wrap Shop in Ontario, California, workers use heat tools to shrink wrap customized graphics onto vehicles. And what that does is helps this have a little more conformability to the curves and contours of a vehicle. Typically, for installing or removing graphics, a heat gun runs between 400 to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, but can get much hotter. This is not a hair dryer. A hair dryer, you're in the very low 100 degrees. This is 1,100 degrees. If I were to put my hand a foot out in front of this, I would be burnt almost immediately. Like a hair dryer, the gun uses a heating element. But here, it's much more sophisticated and a lot more controlled. The way that an industrial heat gun is designed, we would bring the power in through a cord in the back. We have a switch box that dials in through an LCD the temperature we're going to achieve. Once we reach that achieved temperature, we will balance there and maintain that throughout the operation. Besides heating graphics, heat guns are used in shrinking electrical tubing, car repair, and curing polymers. Virtually anywhere that you can imagine maintenance is going on or production, they're using heat. The 1100 degree heat gun not hot enough for you? Gator Wraps also uses a super hot gas torch. This gets much hotter than a lighter. We're putting that out to a hot blue flame around 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. The torch works very simply. The only control is a valve like a kitchen faucet. If I open the faucet, I get more water. If I open the valve on a butane tool, I get more heat. I don't have the control that I have with electric, but I do have the ability to use it in remote applications. These include soldering, among other things. And even though this pocket-sized torch may be handy, it would still severely burn you within a fraction of a second. So while this vehicle gets all dressed up using heat, another one is enduring thousands of degrees just to get a break. At approximately 6,200 degrees Fahrenheit,
Tungsten holds the record for highest melting point of any element at atmospheric pressure. Super Hot will return on Modern Marvels, here on History. Much faster than a speeding bullet, NASA's next spacecraft, the Orion, will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, generating super hot surface temperatures over 4,800 degrees Fahrenheit. The extreme heat is created by friction, a force opposing motion between any two surfaces. Friction is something which converts energy into heat. And worldwide, we spend one third of all energy just to overcome friction. At the Center for Advanced Friction Studies at Southern Illinois University, researchers are spending some of their energy studying the effects of the super hot temperatures generated by aircraft and race car brakes. It's really severe, high temperature friction. While that airplane brake, it's more than 4,000 Fahrenheit. And in Formula One brake, it's 3,600 Fahrenheit easily in the race. Every situation generates friction. It could be a saw cutting through wood, a submarine moving through water, or even feet walking on pavement. Before man knew anything about friction, he was using it to create fire. When it's time to stop a fast-moving object, friction is crucial, and with it comes some super hot temperatures. Slamming on the brakes of a 220 mile per hour race car means plenty of heat has to go somewhere. You're putting a lot of heat very rapidly into these disks. Okay, so you're gonna see temperatures exceeding 1200 degrees C. To endure these temperatures, the brake material of choice for race cars and aircraft is carbon. That stays stable, extremely high temperatures, whereas steel brakes would fail at those high temperatures. They'd melt. Different carbon brakes demand different carbon fiber structuring. In Formula One, for example, the fibers are, are actually uh, layers of cloth material, such as this. And what they do in order to hold these layers together is they press it. It allows for a three-dimensional axis. So now the heat can transfer from this surface to the inside very rapidly. These cooling vents allow for air to flow through them and pull the heat away from the brake material. To put a full-scale carbon racing brake to the test, the center reproduces real-life braking on a machine called a dynamometer. What you will see being tested is a NASCAR brake setup. The brake glows red hot as it runs through the simulation. A thermal camera records temperatures at initial braking, sometimes called flash temperatures. To simulate an automotive size brake, we have to cool it. Because as you know, as you're moving, you have airflow going around that brake. So we have large cooling fans that are built right into the system that allow us to simulate the exact cooling rate that a car has. The dynamometer runs the brakes through several cycles imitating the repetitive braking that occurs during an actual race. Occasionally, they even test racing brakes to the point of failure to avoid them breaking apart on the racetrack. Down the hall, another dynamometer tests subscale aircraft brake samples. These subscale brakes are only about 1 100th the size of real aircraft brakes but are a lot less expensive to test. Almost 1,500. Wow. Look at that. Look at the smoke coming off of that. It's 17 yet? Ugh, that's hot. That's hot. We like to push it sometimes to the limit, and that's important because the companies really want to know what happens. Manufacturers such as Megat Aircraft Braking Systems take tests to the next level with full-size wheels, brakes, and tires. Their brakes may face their greatest tests during a rejected takeoff. You're moving down the runway at 170 miles an hour, 
and all of a sudden something fails, you gotta stop. Much of the energy needed for the stop goes to the brakes, causing rubbed surface temperatures over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Within each brake system are multiple brake discs, either stationary or rotating. The intense heat starts where the discs contact one another and dissipates out within a few seconds. But fly at ease. Each brake design must go through hundreds of qualification and certification tests to make sure it's up to the task. There's a lot of friction heat when the tire hits the tarmac. But geologists feel heat of another kind when their boots meet a super hot Mother Earth. One large aircraft brake can absorb enough energy to stop 160 cars, each weighing 3,000 pounds and traveling 70 miles per hour. Super Hot will return on Modern Marvels. At least once a week, geologists from the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, or HVO, take a helicopter to an active lava flow on the Kilauea volcano to collect data and samples. Sampling is a crucial means of monitoring lava temperatures and volcano activity. Potentially, it can also save thousands of lives. Today's site happens to be in the Royal Garden subdivision that's been slowly buried by more than 37 square miles of lava over the last 25 years. We're standing right over Royal Street, which is at the base of, uh, right at the base of Royal Garden subdivision. And Royal Street was covered by this lava you see here uh, over the last week. So a week ago, this was a road surface. Now it's a field of Pahoy Hoy and A'a. Pahoy Hoy and A'a are the two primary types of Hawaiian lava. Pahoy Hoy is faster flowing, ropey fluid lava while Aa uh -uh is slower, very rough and chunky. As the geologists search for a good lava sampling spot, they carefully walk across the weak old 200 degree Fahrenheit surface, sometimes only a few feet above 2000 degree active lava. As long as you don't get too cocky, if you don't have fear and caution within you, that's when you're going to get tagged by the volcano. The Kilauea volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii is often considered the most active volcano in the world. Scientists from all over the world take advantage of Kilauea's almost continuous lava flows to better understand the super hot world of volcanoes. You can see that channel over there, so they walk around. The reason why volcanoes exist is that they're structural points of weakness in the crust that allows the molten core to rise up. Rising molten rock called magma comes up through vents extending more than 37 miles down to a simmering hot spot fed by the Earth's molten core, more than 1,800 miles below. Besides Kilauea, the vents can supply magma to Mauna Loa, the largest volcano on Earth, and a new submarine volcano called Loihi. You couldn't have an Earth or any of the other planets if it wasn't for the molten activity. Understanding the physics of volcanoes has taken off. And so the instruments in order to monitor volcanoes have also become more sophisticated. These instruments include a thermal camera called FLIR, one method of measuring the temperature of the active lava. The active Aa and Pahoehoe is on the order of six or 700 degrees uh, Celsius on the exterior. And on the interior, of course, it's very much hotter. It's on the order of 1,100 degrees C. Once you get close to the lava, then just the heat kind of reminds you that it's a dangerous place. So you become more cautious just kind of automatically. We wear Nomex suits. They're required for our helicopter ride, but they offer the added benefit of being protective against lava. Absolutely wear leather gloves. They also wear heavy boots to keep their feet out of a hot situation. 
and we usually, if we're very close, we put on a face mask and sunglasses to cover our face. Geologist Matt Patrick locates a good spot for lava sampling. We're going to this active breakout, and we're going to get a sample. The reason we sample is so that we can measure the, uh, the chemical composition. This tells us about the magmatic plumbing system, how it's changing over time. And I'm going to use the water to chill or quench the sample. That freezes uh, the lava as it was in the system. If you let it cool too slowly, then it basically permits secondary crystallization that kind of obscures the signal that we're looking for. I'm shielding my face just because of the radiant heat is intense. Um, we call these toes. As you can see, the lava, the way it extrudes and flows in Pahoyhoy is that it just comes out in small toes, as you can see here. The crust chills very quickly and becomes brittle, but the inside is still moving and stretching, so the brittle crust just gets uh, basically uh, snapped off. But this whole flow you see here, which is only a week old, is really the incremental result of numerous toes such as these, working day and night, slowly invading the landscape. As you can see, it's incandescent. It's coming right through this, from this tube. It's very hot on the order of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is four or five times the temperature of your oven. Yeah, it's very hot when you're this close. It's like, the consistency is like thick molasses, as you can see. As soon as you do this, your discomfort level increases exponentially. As the lava cools for a couple of minutes, Matt takes GPS readings to attach to the samples. At this point, we've put the GPS waypoint on the bag and the, and the date and the name of the sampler and the location, and we just transfer it into our little sample bag. After a hot day in the field, Matt is back to the safety of the HBO, observing his thermal images many of which were filmed from the helicopter. Flow field is very expansive, and often with the naked eye, it's difficult to tell which areas, which portions are active and which are inactive. The thermal camera gives us a very quick synoptic view of where activity is localized, but a more accurate view of the hazards and the hazardous areas. These are the samples that we collected earlier today, and these fragments that were chilled uh, in the water. And the next step is mailing these off to our colleagues on the mainland at the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Washington State. And they're going to use XRF, or, which is X-ray fluorescence, to basically measure the chemistry, the composition. This analysis can tell the scientists not only the composition of the lava, but also its source, age, and molten temperature. And that's important because if things are changing, then that may be a prelude to changes in the eruption style. And changes in eruption style could mean danger for those living in nearby communities. To further monitor eruption activity, the HVO uses various time-lapse cameras across the volcano, recording day and night. We certainly can't control the power of Earth's volcanoes. But with tools like these and vigorous sampling, we now have an excellent chance of knowing when to get out